Um, welcome this morning. Um, we're on a series <clears throat> on surviving and thriving. I um, had the opportunity early last week to go see Dunkirk. I don't know if any of you have seen that movie. It's about um, <clears throat> a story of hundreds of thousands of allies stuck on the beaches of Dunkirk um, and uh, during World War II. And um, the Germans were uh, in those towns on that beach and wouldn't, wouldn't attack the beach uh, because they were um, open targets for the German Air Force. And then once they got into the, the bay there, uh, they were being torpedoed by German submarines. And so uh, they never attacked. But the story is about um, rescuing those men off the shore. And uh, not just military uh, transport, but also civilian boats from across the, uh, the channel there. They came uh, to rescue as many as they could. And uh, ultimately saved three, over 300,000 troops. And a scene in that movie just hit me as, as I was reflecting on our study. As they came off those transports and those boats uh, uh, in England, uh, the people were greeting them and just lauding them. And, and uh, uh, hugging them and giving them food. And you would hear, you guys are heroes, you guys are heroes. And one of the men turned to the other guy, and he's the guy you follow through the whole deal. I mean, there's at different points he should have been dead. And he just turned to the guy next to me and said, all we did was survive. And I thought, that is not the picture of what the Lord intended for our lives to be. I think the onslaught of the enemy at different times in our lives could be equated to what I saw kind of visually in that movie, uh, that the enemy uh, can, can sometimes uh, bring waves of attack into our lives. But I don't think that was God's intent for us. As we learn to resist the enemy and see him flee, I, I don't think that was the picture for our, our lives as Christians. And so I think this is a really important study for us. My assignment today is to uh, kind of discuss what it means to love God with all our might. And also to reflect on uh, the fact that following Jesus is a manly thing to do. And uh, I think those are important things for us to learn. So um, pray with me this morning. Um, I, I need the Lord's guidance in this time. Father, I come to you today uh, recognizing that um, we need to know you and we need to know you better. Father, we recognize uh, from your word that when Isaiah got to see you, that um, it exposed some things in his life. And Father, we need things exposed in our life. And Father, as we uh, come to uh, receive that burning coal from the altar on our lips and experience the forgiveness that you have offered us, it causes us to be positioned in such a way that when you say, who will go for us? Who, who can we send? That we jump forward and say, send me. So Lord, help us to know you better. Help us to know you in that way. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1985, there was a, um, a seminar called the Jesus Seminar. And uh, a group of 50 supposed scholars, I, I use that word lightly, and a hundred laymen attempted what they said to reconstruct the life of the historical Jesus. And uh, members use the audacity in this, okay? Members use colored beads to decide their collective view 
of the historicity of the deeds and the sayings of Jesus. They created, really, a Jesus based on the presupposition of all their members. Um, their premises, and this will affect, of course, their vote, were anti-supernatural. And so their conclusion was, um, Jesus didn't walk on the water. Uh, he couldn't have fed 5,000 with a few loaves and fish. Um, Obviously, he didn't die and was resurrected, born of a virgin. I mean, they just cast out the things that were of a supernatural nature. And they didn't believe in the canon of Scripture. Okay? And so, um, they described, actually described the Gospels as fallible historical artifacts. Well, they got it wrong. <clears throat> but, they discounted 80% of what Jesus said. Now, that's kind of significant. We're going to look at some of that later. But um, this, this seminar uh, came as a counteraction against what they said, they, who they call literalist views of the Scripture, uh, of which we would all agree that Scripture should be taken literally, just as it's written to us. And uh, that was their reaction to it. Already they have starting in the red. This, this seminar um, almost eliminated the entire book of John as they reflected on what did Jesus really say. Now I share this with you because um, there's a couple of things as we think about following Jesus in a manly way and loving God with all of our might. There's some things that really have added confusion to us. This is an extreme. But how often have we treated the word as not efficient or not sufficient for us? How often do we look at it? If we thought that the word was um, what it claims to be, um, would we even struggle with getting into it? And would we have trouble putting it down as we study it? if we truly saw it as all-sufficient for us. And even though this is an extreme, they started in some, some really strange places to begin to discern uh, what Jesus actually did and what Jesus actually said. Okay. But how often have we reconstru reconstructed Jesus without our own bias? You know, this leaves us kind of confused and impotent when it comes to loving God with our whole heart and mind and soul and strength. Okay. I think there's another area of, of um, hindrance, I think, as we consider these things this morning. And that is what many have called the feminization of Christianity. And I'm taking some of this information from this article that you see there um, the na same name, Feminization of Christianity by Brett and Kate, Kate McKay. You see it on that website. If you want to go and read that article later, it's, it's pretty extensive. I'm just going to touch on some things that, that they share in that article. I used to think that this phenomenon in, in the church happened, er, happened recently. Um, I grew up in the 50s and 60s as a child, and in my church... Uh, men held all the positions of leadership. I had, in my older elementary years, um, men who, who uh, taught in Sunday school, taught my Sunday school classes. Um, they made the decisions in the church. And it was a, it was a, a brethren church at, at that kind of changed into a Methodist church while, while we were there. You've noticed today the difference in the Methodist church leadership. I mean, I... I think there are more women pastors in that church now than there are men. Uh, there's been some radical changes. And so I thought it was kind of a recent development. Well, the McKays um, really tie it back even farther to the uh, later Middle Ages. Um, is there a way to make that fit? <clears throat> uh, I don't know either. Okay. In the later Middle Ages, a, uh, a, a teaching came out that 
was called bridal mysticism. This is the idea that Jesus was not just the bridegroom to the church. Okay? He's also our own personal bridegroom. And so um, uh, each individual believer could experience Jesus in that way. Uh, what's interesting about that, it was a carried, that, that little S right there, that's the last part of the word Puritans. <laughs> it was carried by the Puritans into the New World. Writings of uh, Cotton Mather, uh, famous Puritan, and Thomas Hooker, another, uh, you read in their writings these teachings. And it eventually affected us today and and in uh, this thought that Jesus is my boyfriend, uh, almost in a romantic way, it was an appeal to women, but also for guys, it became Jesus is my buddy, he's my pal, he's my best friend. Um, and that really became common in some of the music as um, contemporary Christian music kind of was birthed in the 60s. You began to see some of that imagery in that early music. And I think you can see the danger in this and see it played out in our day to day. Once the personal relationship with Jesus was emphasized, the church kind of became unnecessary. And you see that really played out strongly today. Uh, young men that I talk to that really have no interest in the church. Uh, they, that's their, that's their go-to. I, I mean, I have a relationship with Jesus. Uh, I, I'm good with that. It's me and him against the world kind of kind of attitude. <clears throat> you know, before this period, manhood was was um, kind of proven in the public square, outwardly. But this kind of mystic uh, approach to our relationship with the Lord kind of turned the Christian faith inward. And we've seen that played out. The McKay's... Um, give some reasons for it. They, they really um, measure the feminization of the church by um, membership and attendance over, over the history of the church, most recent history. Uh, the Puritans saw uh, when the population was 60% men, 40% women, that 80% of the church was made up of women and 20% men in the late 1600s. So much so that Cotton Mather, even though he's teaching about bridal mysticism, he is also really concerned about that, why that, those, those numbers are that way. In the 1800s, uh, the population was 52% men, so a pretty close equation between men and women, but... Uh, Women in the church were uh, outnumbering men 65% to 35%. Now, during the 1800s, you see there it says muscular Christian, Christianity movement. In, in England, there was this, this movement toward muscular Christianity. It was characterized by belief in patriotic duty, manliness, uh, the moral and physical beauty of athleticism, teamwork, Discipline, self-sacrifice. You know, when I read all that. Um, I re it reminded me of the movie Chariots of Fire that happened late 1800s into the 1900s. And a lot of those characteristics were kind of portrayed in that movie, if you remember that. This is their quote. It sought the expulsion of all that is effeminate, un-English, and excessively intellectual. And... Um, there was a number of groups that kind of rose up out of this. YMCA was birthed during this time as a response. But then in the 1900s, there was a, um, a survey by the YMCA that showed church membership was two-thirds women. And then something really interesting happened uh, Post-war, 1950s and 60s, and again, that's when I was brought up, so I, this is where I was thinking that I, I uh, maybe had a, an, a lack of understanding of the history of this. Um, the, the 
equation kind of changed where what you saw in the population was equated in the churches. So um, men took active role in the church then and maybe some of that came out of the influences of, of from that generation that came out of World War II and the Korean and Vietnam War conflict, those things that kind of led some to the church and their responsibility there. But then it rolled back after the 60s into the same kind of two-thirds women, one-third men in the church. The article discusses some more cultural influences. Uh, there, there's been a, a recent uh, masculine movement kind of things. Promise Keepers. I remember Promise Keepers uh, uh, playing in some of the worship uh, arenas in, in that movement locally. Um, never really fit. I, I didn't ride motorcycles. Um, I, I like to watch a good game, but I wasn't extremely athletic. Um, they appreciated me leading worship, but other than that, when they did their breakouts, it was something with a weapon. And I, I, I don't mind shooting a weapon. I, I just don't, I don't hunt. I don't fish. Um, I freaked out the first time I put a worm on a hook. I didn't realize he felt it. <laughs> so, uh, I, the way they kind of presented themselves out front, teaching was good. There were some things that were really good in that movement. I, I, I didn't really fit. Men's fraternity kind of came up out of that era. We uh, we've learned a lot through um, what uh, those three years of training uh, brought us. It's followed up today by guys like Brad Stein, David Murrow, who wrote "Why Men Hate Going to Church." Uh, Paul Coughlin wrote a book, uh, No More Christian Nice Guy. Uh, and then Mark Driscoll at Mars Hill Church, he, he is pressing in in this area too. And um, Brandon O'Brien wrote a critique on uh, the masculinity movement today. And uh, I, uh, he wrote it in a book, or, I mean in an article, A Jesus for Real Men. I wanted to put that up there so you could read those. But I wanted to say that, first of all, he, um, he respected those mo the movement today in many ways. Um, they tried to accomplish uh, some things. They recognized that the Jesus of the Bible, unlike the Jesus of much of uh, contemporary Christian and art and music, was not afraid to denounce and not afraid to challenge and not afraid to offend. So those are some important things about Jesus that, that changed what came out of the 60s when they were trying to make him a, a lover or a pal. Uh, he said, in short, the movement reminds us of what Jesus and Paul insisted. The gospel is an offense and discipleship is an invitation to the cross. But he does share some concerns too. And I know these are all cut off. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and go through them with you. Uh, he, he believes that this movement sees the church's fixation on morality as part of the church's feminization. Which is odd. I mean, there's a responsibility for us to walk in holiness. And, and there's some things we do there to make that happen. And so, um, I've heard that by young men who resist going to church. They feel like it's just, they want, the church wants to put them under a set of laws and make them do stuff. Well... There's some reality there we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, they believe that regaining a biblical image of Christ is as simple as remasculating Jesus. Uh, reclaiming the things that are masculine about him. Uh, their rhetoric, and not all these men, but I've read some of them, their rhetoric assumes manly instincts are inherently godly. And of course, we all know that that's not entirely true. And then he believes their framework excludes women from real discipleship. He says if Christ is the model of masculinity, then women can't imitate him. They can pursue him as the lover of their souls. They can imitate his devotion to the Father in their relationships with their husbands. But they can't become like him in any essential way. And so he makes some conclusions in this article, he says, fortunately for both men and women, the Bible never speaks of Christians as reformed men or women. 
but as altogether new creations. He says, Scripture gives no indication that Jesus came to earth to model masculinity. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, and as such, he is not simply the perfect male. He is the perfect human being. He exhibited the qualities that should characterize all believers. And then he says that Christ highlights the essential unity of men and women. And then one last thought, just to kind of pull some of this together. Uh, here's what the movement misses. Jesus doesn't call men to be more manly or women to be more womanly. Jesus calls both to become like him. Men and women are to embody meekness, gentleness, self-control, humility, as well as strength, courage, resolve, and boldness as they grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus. Muscular Christianity distorts this. A hyper-masculine Jesus results in the alienation of men and women from the real Jesus. So, what does that mean to exercise our manhood and follow Jesus with all of our strength to love him with all that we are. What, what does that mean? Well, the more I study, the more I'm convinced of Paul's conclusion in his life that all the things of the flesh that he could put confidence in, he counted as rubbish. If we are going to love God with all our might and follow Jesus, we need to do what he said. I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. That's Philippians 3. And as I read that, I'm going, man, does that portray my life? Do I really know him? And do I really know him well? You know, we really get to know someone by their actions. We looked last spring at Jesus, you know, in our systematic theology study. And we looked at his person, and we looked at the atonement, this, this action that he did, uh, and the benefits of that. Uh, we looked at his resurrection and ascension, and we talked about the offices of Christ, being prophet, priest, and king. And we tried to make some personal application to those things. But well, we also get to really know somebody by what they say. And I want to look at some things that Jesus said, some, some hard things that he said. Uh, this has been kind of, uh, before this week, kind of a, a, a process for me. Um, I was looking at some of these things before, and so um, this is a work in progress for me too. But as we do it, I, I want us to look at it through the pattern that Paul set in Ephesians. You know, he... Uh, discussed putting on and putting off. Put off the old man, put on the new man. Mark kind of mentioned this in his message yesterday. Uh, we are new creations in Christ, okay? And in there we're to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. And, and just an example of this, he mentions in that passage in Ephesians, he who steals must steal no longer, something to put off, Okay? What do we put on? Well, he must labor, performing with his hands what is good. He's supposed to put that on. And now there's a reason for that. His mind needs to be renewed here. So that he will have something to share with one who has need. Okay, so uh, Paul illustrates that principle throughout that passage in Ephesians 4 and Ephesians 5. And, and, and you can look at that. What I want to do is I want to take some of the things that Jesus said that, were, that are hard things. And, uh, and see if we can't apply them to our lives. I think we can no longer presume on God's grace to give us a pass for our sin. And we'll see that here in just a minute. One of the things that Jesus said, um, and this is in the Passion Week, he's just rode into Jerusalem, and he goes to the synagogue, and he says, My house shall be called a house of prayer but you are making it a robber's den. 
That's Matthew 21, but it's really a quote from Jeremiah 7, verse 8 through 11. Now listen to this passage of Jeremiah. Um, I need to get the bottom of it. This is the Lord's word to Israel. Behold, you are trusting in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and offer sacrifices to Baal, and walk after other gods that you have not known? Then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered that you may do all these abominations. In other words, Lord, you've delivered me. Now I can go and do whatever I want to do because you've delivered me. I, there's a presumption on, on the Lord here. No interest in reform, just that we may do all these abominations. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your sight? Behold, I, even I, have seen it, declares the Lord. One commentator on this passage said the Israelites persistently trusted more in God's willingness to overlook their faults so as to uphold his name and his glory than to actually repent and reform themselves. A robber's den is where robbers go to hide, right? The church was never intended to be the place for us to hide and then to presume that God just forgives us. What do, we, what do we need to put off? Well, we need to put off passivity toward our personal failures. Own, own our sin. And then we need to put on prayer and repentance. Really, all of these have an implication for repentance. We need a persistent spirit toward personal reformation. I almost used the word transformation there, but we've all been metamorphosized already. If, if we know Christ, we are the new creation, okay? But there's some things that we have given ourselves a pass on. There's some things that we've allowed to stay in our lives. And, um, and it's time for us to reform Do we live by giving ourselves a pass for our sin? According to the scripture, that is not an option. Romans 5.20 says, The law came in so that transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And then Paul follows that teaching with Romans 6.1 and 2. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Another statement that Jesus made, and it's similar to this, he goes to the adulterous woman. Remember what happened there? He's riding in the ground, and those that came to throw the rocks all began to leave. And he asked her, where, where are those that condemn you? And she said, they're gone. And he says, well, I do not condemn you either. Go. And that wasn't all Jesus said. From now on, sin no more. We love the experience of being not condemned, but we want to stop there. But he commended her, go and sin no more. And she had a pretty messed up life. You all remember that. You know, it's interesting in this period, later on you find that there was kind of a revival of, of uh, love for Christ in that area that we kind of hold that woman responsible for. She goes back and tells everybody what this man has done in her life and shares this experience. What do we, what do we put off here? We, we can't, uh, uh, what C.S. Lewis calls cheap grace, right? We love the results of the cross, but the responsibilities we, we're, we're not keen on. We need to put off the presumption that God's forgiveness gives us a pass to continue sinning. Again, 
passivity toward personal failure and sin and put on repentance. And this is, I just used some of the same material here, a persistent spirit toward personal reformation. What should we think about? The requirements of holiness are not abolished in my relationship with the Lord. We see many in our, our day that, that walk there. They, they believe that's legalism, okay? The requirements have not gone away for us to, to continue the process of sanctification in our lives. And yes, that good work will be completed, but, but why would I presume on, okay, I'm, everything's going to be great at the end and just kind of put up with my failures in the process. That's not thriving in the Christian life. Here's another statement that Jesus made. Everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You know, a lot of times I've missed that part. Uh, I I've even quoted this verse by saying, has already committed adultery in his heart. No, committed adultery with her in his heart. And that may not be a living person that you've seen. It may just be something out of a magazine or off the internet, okay? What do I put off? I've got to put off everything that places me in a position of compromise in this area. I have to put it off. I can't assume that I'm strong enough to be able to walk through this area in my life as a guy and win victory over this if I'm going to continually place myself in a position of compromise. What do I put on? I need to, I need to repent. Listen, I need to repent of the sin of adultery. That, I, I don't need to repent of the bad thoughts I have or, or, or getting on the internet in inappropriate places or whatever. That's all surfacey stuff. I, I need to repent of adultery. And that should break us when the Lord says that. But if you just think about your love for your wife and what that would mean if it was, a, if it was something that you physically did. Okay, outside of your marriage vows. Uh, the Lord's saying, you've committed adultery with her in your heart if you've lusted for her. We should dwell on things that are true and honorable and right and pure, lovely, of good repute. Dwell on anything of excellence, anything worthy of praise. Listen, there's no confusion here. We need to repent of adultery and take whatever steps to win the victory. Listen, that may mean getting a brother involved. We might need to bring somebody alongside us that we trust and say, man, I'm really struggling in this area. I need, I need you to hold me accountable. By the way, while we fight this war, if you frequent... Facebook or some other social media, be careful what you post. I've gone into um, things that have been posted by church members and, uh, and clicked on the article, and that article uh, uh, connects to another article that connects to another article, and at some point, the language and the, vi the image images and some of those things are things that I'm trying to not place myself in a position of compromise. And, uh, uh, and that may mean I'm not going to follow any stream if I have any thought that it's going to go a, a direction that I shouldn't be walking down. So let's, let's protect our brothers in this. Jesus said, I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. You know, the beginning of that passage says, you've heard it that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. And then he follows it up with this. But I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. Same discipline, same punishment for as if you had murdered. Okay. So what do we need to put off? We need to put off anger toward a brother. 
and put on reconciliation. Scripture says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. See, we as sinful people are going to bring offense to one another. It's going to happen. We're commended to a ministry of reconciliation. And not just to reconcile, reconcile unbelievers to God. But those in the body that we know have something against us. I said it that way because that's the way it says in Matthew 5. It says, if you bring your gift to the altar, and while you're there, the Spirit shows you that someone has something against you, you're to leave your gift and be reconciled, and then come back and offer your gift. So it's important for us to, to, to be discerning here. And, and sometimes that's, we need the Lord to tell us, this, this person has something against you. you that, what they said was maybe a sarcastic tone, but they've got something against you. Go and be reconciled with them. I think we talk about masculinity in Christianity that... Um, this this uh, um, overt taking of authority and 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 allowing anger to to kind of rile us up about things is 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 considered a good thing. Um, listen, I think uh, some of the things that we're angry about that we see in our society is important, um, but a lot of our anger really is is not that. It's almost as if we think our battle is not against, I mean, is against flesh and blood rather than something else going underneath. Here's something similar. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. By the way, um, that word persecute is interesting. Uh, scripture says we've not suffered under the shedding of blood yet <laughs> in our battling against sin. It, that's the context of that passage. What do we put off? We need to put off hate um, and put on love and intercessory prayer. When I say intercessory prayer, um, my wife struggled for many years with uh, things going on with her relationship with her dad. And she would pray for forgiveness and, and, and receive it. And then she'd walk into a store and some song would um, prompt her emotionally in something in her past, in the relationship with her father. And, and she would begin to just um, ha a weep and struggle again. But Lord, I forgave him, I forgave him, I forgave And she won victory at one point when she began to intercede for her dad and pray uh, that the Lord would prosper her dad. When she crossed over into that kind of intercession for her father, she won victory. She never struggled again with wondering whether the forgiveness was real or whether it happened or what. She just won victory. And in his last days, uh, she nursed him. Even with some of the verbal abuse still there, she nursed him. And when he came out of surgery, it was, where's Renee? I mean, she, there was a relationship there that wasn't there before as it developed, but it came, her freedom to do that came when she began to intercede, but not just intercede um, to find forgiveness in what she was feeling about her dad. It was, Lord, prosper my dad. Help him to live his last days in, in victory over sin. And he, she would just pray those kinds of prayers for him. And any time the enemy wanted to turn her down the other path, she immediately went in intercessory prayer for him. We pray for those who persecute us. We love them. We do that. We show ourselves in this passage, it says, we show ourselves as sons of the heavenly Father in order to bring him glory. I mean, that's, that's what needs to change in our mind as we walk through this. Jesus said this, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. What do we need to put off? The self. The flesh. And, and we put on the cross. And we put it on daily. It, I think we're good at maybe putting on the cross a couple of days a week. But uh, this is a, a, a necessary discipline for us in our, battle, in our battle against our flesh. And 
And I just put this verse here just to help us renew our minds. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? I think, again, this, uh, uh, this plays out really well in families. And, and we know as guys, uh, uh, when, when we want our time, okay, and when it gets interrupted by, stu- by somebody else's needs or desires or wants, um, things rise up in us. We, we want our time. And uh, we need to learn what it means to put off the flesh. And I think some of those instances in our homes are, are there to help us do that. I think it's important for us to just see that for what it is. Okay, Lord, you want me to put my, my desires, my wants down right now and focus on what the real need is here. By the way, I, I wanted to make this comment when we were talking earlier about loving our enemies and praying for those who persecute you. Um, again, I want to say, be really careful what you post on social media. Um, because it reflects this issue. And there's a lot of hate out there among Christians toward toward the government, toward Muslims, toward certain family members toward businesses. I I mean, it's a place where people can spew hate without even thinking about the consequences or result of it. And and, um, I don't want to consider a church person, one of my brothers or sisters, in my body, and the first thing I think about are the posts that they have that keep spewing this kind of animosity toward others. Um. So it may be we need to be ones that um, challenge that in our body. I, I don't know. I just know that it's not a good testimony for that to be uh, what people would consider of us if all we're doing is, is, a, is negative posts towards individuals or people. Um, without what we really need to do is express love toward them and intercede for them. Uh, many of them are just blind. We were blind once. We know what that's like. And so, um, just a thought there. I, I, I didn't want to bypass that. I'd underlined it in my notes. I want to make sure we had talked about that. This is the final one I want to talk about today. Jesus said this to who? Peter, right? Get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. And and you remember what Peter was doing. In his mind, it was a good thing to protect Jesus from his enemies, right? And Jesus was saying, but that's not God's interests. That's your interest. God's got a deeper work here. I need to put off setting my mind on my interests. Philippians says to consider the interests of others, not just my own, but to consider the interests of others. But really, I need to set my mind on what God's interests are. And and how do I do that? How do I do that? I need to know God, and I need to know Him well. And that takes time. I I wouldn't want to be um, I wouldn't want Jesus to say that to me, but I'm afraid that um, too many times in my life um, he could say that about me. I know those instances where I was fully aware of what God's interests were in my life and and walked that path. But I know there's many times that I was much more concerned about my interests than what His were. And, and a lot of times his don't make sense in my, my finite mind. But ultimately, they're the best. 
And so as we conclude today, I want to read this passage. If all I've done today, and I I pray that this would be true, is that I've stirred up a hunger for you to know him and know him well, then, then we've fulfilled what we need to do this morning. And um, it's time. We, we no longer can settle for those things that beset us. It's, ta- it's time for us to, to rise up as men... Here, here's a manly element to it. Rise up as men and to begin to fight those things that uh, tear us away from knowing him better. Is there a connection between our obedience and knowing him? Yeah, one of my favorite verses is John fourteen twenty one, where it says, He who has my commandments and keeps them. And that, that's not meaning has perfectly obeyed them. He could have said that. But keeps them, nurtures them, ra- uh, raises those, those commandments up, uh, respects them, guards them. Uh, he who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he'll be loved by my Father. And I will love him And I will manifest myself to him. I will show myself to him. He will get to know me well. And that verse starts with having his commandments and keeping them. Listen to this passage and we'll close. This is Hebrews 12 starting in verse 4. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. Now that implies something. Right? Um, it's, it, our striving against sin should be a war. It should be intently before us. Okay? We've not, we've not shed blood over it yet. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our own good so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Let's pray. Father, I just ask, Lord, that you would uh, strengthen our hands to the task Strengthen those things that are feeble in us that has, uh, over the weeks and months and years, allowed us to um, walk in a way that is uh, not victorious and presume on your grace and your mercy. And in many ways, Lord, in our day and age, mistake um, the, the peace that we experience and the goodness in our lives as, um, as making that all okay. Father, I pray that your spirit would convict us, continue to convict us of our sin. Lord, that we would uh, take that um, seriously 
that we would see the urgency uh, to uh, breaking the yoke of some of these things in our lives. That we might get to know you better. And that our lives could be used to bring glory and honor to our God. So help us in the process, Lord, as we uh, work through these things personally. Help us to uh, help us to come to victory, Lord. Help us to thrive as we deal with the onslaught of the enemy and as we deal with our own flesh. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't have um, things to ponder, but I think the Lord has given us some things to ponder this morning. So as you get in your small groups today, let's, uh, let's press through some of these things personally.